Welcome to Manifest, hosted by international evangelist, teacher, and author Perry Stone. Enjoy unique insight into prophetic and practical truth. It's time to feast on fresh manna, so get ready to be blessed and encouraged. And now, here is your host and teacher, Perry Stone. I'm going to deal today with a subject that's extremely interesting, how a pattern of the ancient prophets is repeating itself in the United States. And the danger of that pattern of what happened to an empire and a major city may be repeated in our time if something does not change drastically very soon. First of all, I want to talk about prophecy for just a moment. Prophecy, I believe, is identified as when God pre-writes the headlines, when he gives you events which are going to happen long before they do. There are three methods of interpreting prophecy. There is what I call the plain meaning of prophecy, then secondly, the symbolism of the prophets, and thirdly, what is called the cycles that are repeated through history. Let me explain. In the plain meaning of prophecy, it says Jerusalem will be surrounded and destroyed, and that's exactly what happened. When the plain sense of the Scripture makes sense, seek no other sense. Many prophecies plainly tell you what's going to take place without any symbolism whatsoever. Secondly is the symbolism of the prophets. This is found throughout the book of Daniel, for example, chapter 7, where an empire represents a lion. An empire represents a leopard. An empire represents a bear. And so prophetic symbolism can be interpreted in the text itself or by comparing it to the other symbols of the Bible. Now, the third thing which we're going to talk about is cycles that repeat themselves in history. Uh, you've heard me talk about it in the past, and I won't bring it up again, how that America has 20 parallels to the Roman Empire. Right now, we literally have at least 20 parallels to the ancient Roman Empire that have been happening in our nation for about the past six to six and a half years. But however, one of the things that has always intrigued me is the spiritual link that we have to the nation of Israel and how clear it is when you understand certain aspects of early American history. For example, when Columbus set sail to discover a new land, he sailed for 40 days. But when he finally came to the coastlines of the islands, it was on the 71st day of his voyage, which happened to be Tishri the 21st, which also happened to be the last day of the Feast of Tabernacles. On the last day of the Feast of Tabernacles, a prayer is prayed of God who brought his people through the waters of the sea. <laughs> Did you hear me? So in other words, a little parallel there, uh, there concerning the day Columbus found land. May 14, 1607. A town was formed, a colony was formed called Jamestown. Now, you may not know this, but the English word James is actually the word Jacob. And for some reason, it's translated as James. So Jamestown could actually be called Jacob's town if we went back to the original language. So Jacob was the father of the nation of Israel. Salem, Massachusetts, where did it get its name? It got its name from Genesis chapter 14, where Abraham met Melchizedek in the city of Salem, S A L. A.M. in your English Bible, and that's where, why Salem, Massachusetts was named after that verse that is in the Bible. The Hebrew laws that are found in the Torah happen to be the laws that were used in our colonies and used by our founders to form our major documents. On April 14, 1775, they were preparing for Passover. Shortly thereafter, there was something called the shot that was heard around the world that initiated what was called the Revolutionary War. At that moment, the British came in and began to chase our Minutemen and chase our men all across the fields, just like Pharaoh, right after Passover, began to chase the Hebrew people to the edge of the Red Sea. So in other words, if we look at the early part of American history, it has patterns to the actual nation of Israel with dates and symbolism and feast days. Now, when I begin to preach something like I'm about to show you, where I go to the Old Testament and I compare something which has happened in the past and how it will repeat itself in the future, there's always people that write me and say, why do you do that? That's not systematic theology. No, it's called rabbinical interpretation of Scripture. It's the, there's 39 her laws of hermeneutics in Judaism in rabbinical interpretation, and one of those is that cycles repeat themselves, and what has been is that which shall be. Let me show you how the New Testament uses this. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, Paul lists five sins of Israel and tells the church, the reason I'm telling you the five sins 
of Israel is so that you do not repeat the same five sins that they did. Second Peter 2 and 6, he talks about the destruction of the city of Sodom. And he says this is written as an example to others who would follow after their example. In Jude chapter 7, the Bible talks about the city of Sodom be, being destroyed. And it says this is set forth as an example of God's judgment. Even in the book of Jude, Jude goes all the way back to the Old Testament. And he talks about Cain, and he talks about Korah, and he talks about Balaam. Balaam, the compromiser, Korah, the rebel, uh, uh, and Cain, the first murderer. And he talks about warning New Testament believers not to follow after the same pattern or the same spirit of these individuals. So, men in the New Testament referred back to the Old Testament to give a pattern and warn people that if you're not careful, what happened in the past is going to be somehow repeated in the future. Israel's blessings, warnings, and judgment can apply actually to the United States because we were raised up believing in the same Bible that the Hebrew people believed in the Torah, the prophets, and for Christians in America, the New Covenant. America was founded by men and women who used the Bible for their life instructions. America's laws were based on Judeo-Christian principles from the Old Testament. America's covenant documents on display in Washington, the Constitution, the Declaration of Independence, the Bill of Rights, were all formed out of Old Testament principles. America's founders viewed America as a new Israel with spiritual Jews and a nation that we were spiritual Jews and a nation that was under divine providence of God. Now, here's what I'd like to show you. We can see, if we observe carefully, that the same sins or acts of disobedience that happened to Israel is repeating itself in America. That the warnings that God gave Israel are also fit for the United States of America. Now, oddly enough, I normally go to the Torah. I go to the five books, and I point this out. I'm going to do something different tonight. I'm going to take two Old Testament prophets. One is the prophet Jonah, and the other is a prophet that you seldom read by the name of Nahum. Some of you didn't even know there was a book of Nahum in the Bible. You're going to go and meet the prophet up there, and he's, you're going to say, who are you? He's going to say, Nahum. He said, you ever read my book? He said, when did you write it? Did Charisma publish it? No. <laughs> Steve Strang's here if you didn't know that, so that's why I said that. Now, what I want to show you is this. There is a major empire of the past that had a capital city that was worn two times, and they were worn two times in a 150-year period. The first time they repented and were spared. The second time they did not repent and they were destroyed. This city and this empire was built through the descendants of a man by the name of Nimrod. Nimrod was a descendant of, if, if you go into the Bible, he was a descendant of Ham, one of the sons of Noah, and he was a great builder. As a matter of fact, in the days of Nimrod, in Genesis chapter 11, you find the Tower of Babel. And the Tower of Babel was a one world government. It was a one world religion. And they were building high buildings and high towers that had never been built of the likes before in history. So what I want to share with you is in the season that you see the forming of these empires, it was global government and one world religion. I don't know if you're aware of this or not. There are men in the earth, 300 families that are are very wealthy. This is not a rumor or a conspiracy theory. They want to emerge the world under one global unit like the Tower of Babel, and they want to merge the world under one religion of tolerance where we are all tolerant and no religion is the right way. No specific one is the only way to God. We are just all in the same pot together. Now for a moment let me talk about Jonah. Jonah is mentioned in 2 Kings chapter 14 and verse 25 and he lived in the days of Jeroboam the second. Here's what the Bible says. He restored the coast of Israel from the entering of Hamath unto the sea of the plain, according to the word of the Lord God of Israel, which he spake by the hand of his servant Jonah, the son of Amitti. And by the way, Amitti means my truth, the prophet, which was in Gath Hefer. And that word Gath Hefer means the wine press. And uh, this area was about five miles from the city of Nazareth. In other words, Jonah lived about five miles from the city of Nazareth. Now, some Jewish rabbis talk about the Shunammite woman. And it never names who the Shunammite woman's husband was. And she had a son that died that was raised from the dead. Some say that was Jonah. Because in the area where that happened, it would not have been that far from Nazareth. Now, here's what I want to share with you. Jonah ministered about 755 B.C. at the same time a prophet Amos was ministering. Amos was ministering in the southern kingdom of Judah. Jonah was ministering in the northern kingdom of Israel with the ten, with the, with the ten tribes that had separated. Jonah 
may have trained under Elisha as one of the sons of the prophets mentioned in 2 Kings chapter 2 and verse 3. He was assigned, however, to warn Nineveh that in 40 days the city was going to be completely destroyed, but instead of warning them, he ran. There has been a debate as to why he ran. Number one, it was a Gentile city. He, being Jewish, may not have liked Gentiles and wanted nothing to do with them and would have just as soon seen him killed. Number two, it would be the Assyrians. Now remember, Nineveh is the capital of Assyria. Say that with me. Nineveh is the capital of Assyria, and Assyria was an empire in the Old Testament. It may have been because the Assyrians would take the ten tribes captive later that Jonah knew that by revelation. He didn't want God to spare him, thinking if God destroyed him, then Israel would one day be spared judgment because the prophets were already warning about this. Now, the third reason may simply be fear. A Jewish man, a Jewish prophet, running up to a Gentile pagan city, screaming, God's going to destroy you in 40 days, may get you killed instead of listened to. However, here's what happened according to history. In 765 B.C., Nineveh had a plague that struck it. They had a solar eclipse in 763 that shocked the entire city because in that day, a solar eclipse was a bad omen that something bad was going to happen. Then another plague struck, this is in history, in 757. When both plagues struck in between a solar eclipse, the Ninevites thought that something terrible was going to happen to them. Then in 765 B.C., See, they had a six year, don't miss this, catch this. They had a six year civil war that hit the nations as the plagues were striking, re greatly reducing their population. So, in other words, Jonah may not have known this, but Nineveh was ripe for revival because the, the city had been split, the civil war had killed people, and all these dear different signs were taking place. Don't you, you stay with me because we're going somewhere. And so, it got the attention of the people when Jonah comes out of this whale, supposed to take him three days to get there, but it gets there in one. Honey, if you'd been in the belly of a fish three days, you'd walk fast too. And he went and he warned the Ninevites. Now, Nineveh repented in sackcloth and ashes. Now, stay with me and follow me carefully. Nineveh repented in sackcloth and ashes, and the, the city of Nineveh and Assyria lasted for another 150 years. But something happened in the fourth generation. Your Bible talks about in the law of God, I'll visit the iniquity of the fathers upon the third and the fourth generation of them that hate me. There's a law of fourth generation in every nation. It was a law of fourth generation in Israel. It was a law of fourth generation in Nineveh. Because in the fourth generation, if a nation has gone so far away from God, then they will go into some form of bondage, captivity, or economic crisis. See, the Bible said the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua, who had seen all the great works of the Lord, but there arose another generation after them that knew not God nor the works that he had done in Israel. So Nineveh is in its fourth generation. They had become very, very, very corrupt. So now Nahum the prophet, 150 years later, brings a final warning that would now be ignored by the people living in the city of Nineveh. Because the people of Nineveh and those living in the area of Assyria did not heed the warning of Nahum, the empire of Assyria completely lost its status and power. It was overtaken by the Medes and the Babylonians, and also the capital city was destroyed. Now, I call this the Nahum Code. Now, in the book of Nahum, he begins to warn the Ninevites that there are five things, five forms of judgment that God is going to send to them. Nahum's warning was 150 years after Jonah's warning. Now, here's what I want to show you, and I want you to keep this in mind, that America had a major warning within our own nation 150 years ago, and it was called the Civil War. Just like Nineveh was warned, and there was a six-year civil war in the country that reduced the population with all kinds of plagues, but they repented because of that. 
were given an additional 150 years to be a city and an empire, but then did not heed the, hunt, the warning of Nahum 150 years later. We are 150 years from the Civil War, and we are going, I'm going to show you something here. We are about to go through the same thing that ancient Nineveh went through if we don't pay attention. But here's what I want to show you that's interesting. The Nahum warning. Now look, 150 years later after the American Civil War, right here is where we're at. There are five warnings that God gave them. Now in Nahum, it's, it says this, you have become a bloody city. America has aborted over 50 million infants. We have now become a nation of blood. Then it says in Nahum 3 and 1, you are a nation full of liars. I found out something about politics. The more you lie, the better chance you have of getting elected. Take that however you will. Now, let me say this. In Nineveh, 150 years later, there was a new king that had come to power, forming a new Assyrian empire or a new world order, if you please. But an internal war started, and it started pitting people against people. In other words, the king of that day, 150 years later, was pitting people against people, causing people to fight other people, not on the outside of the country, but inside the country. Eventually, the Babylonians and the Medes came in. Oh, by the way, the Babylonians today would be the Iranians or the Iraqis, and the Medes and the Persians would be the Iranians. And in case you didn't know it, Iran is on the news consistently. In case you didn't pay attention, Iraq is on the news uh, consistently. And it would be these two empires that would help pull down the Assyrian Empire, helping it to eventually collapse. Now, here are the five things, ladies and gentlemen. Here are the five things that God warned Nineveh about that he was going to send to bring down the city of Assyria, the capital city of Assyria, and the empire. Empire. Let's look at these together. I'll go through the list and then I will go back into an explanation. In the book of Nahum, he says the whirlwind of the Lord is coming. And then it talks about how the seas and the rivers would dry up. Then it talks about how the mountains were going to shake and quake. All of this in the book of Nahum, warning Assyria and warning Nineveh, which I compare to Washington, D.C. and the United States of America. The land was going to be burned. All of this is in the Bible. An overflowing, overrunning flood was going to come to the nation and destroy it. Now, let me just talk to you for a moment about these five things, and let me see if there is some kind of a parallel taking place right now in America. God, the Bible says in Nahum 1 and 3, is going to have his way in the whirlwind. In 2012, it was a record year for tornadoes, 885 tornadoes just in the year 2012. If you know what a tornado is, it is like a whirlwind, similar to what God says to the prophet. Hurricanes, New Orleans, think about this. Katrina comes in and just devastates New Orleans when the levees break. Seven years to the day, folks, seven years to the day, another tornado comes in by the name of Isaac. Now, Katrina means cleansing. Isaac means laughter. And another one comes in, a, a category one, and bless their heart, people who had rebuilt their homes just moved in and get hit again with overflowing floods of water. Number two, God says to Nahum, tell Nineveh, tell Nineveh, pardon me, tell Washington and tell the United States that the sea and the rivers are going to dry up. In the Bible, it says the Bashan and Carmel are going to languish. Bashan was the place where the cattle were. Carmel was the place where the fruit was. Now, in case you didn't know it, 2012 has been some of the worst droughts in nine states. 56% of America was in a drought in 2012. One farm, one farm alone, lost 70% of its corn. The cattle had been slain and killed and sold in many areas because the grain is too high. Grain went up 63%, and since the farmers couldn't afford the grain, they went ahead and sold their cattle, and the cattle was slaughtered. Now, what did the Bible say? The Bible say things would start drying up, and it's going to affect your food supply, and it's going to affect your cattle. I hope somebody's listening to the what the Tennessee preacher say it. The third thing was, God said in verse 4 of Nahum 1, the mountains are going to quake. One day, everybody say one day. One day in California recently, 300 swarms of earthquakes just in one day. There have been hundreds at the first of the year just in two days at a place called Yellowstone Park, and now we're having 
earthquakes in places like Washington, D.C., which almost have never experienced an earthquake before. God says in Nahum 1 and 4, now Nineveh and Assyria, pardon me, now Washington and America, you're the capital and you're the capital of the nation. Your land is going to be burned. West and Midwest fires have burnt millions and millions of acres, and there's been more trees lost in 2012 in six states than any other time of record fires. It is odd. Oh, my Lord, help me now. It has oddly been linked to the treatment of Israel. It seems when we and our administration begins to shove Netanyahu under the bus and begins to turn on Israel, weird things within 24 to 48 hours begin to happen in America. Now there's an overflowing fl flood or an overrunning flood, the Bible says, in verse 8. I don't think I need to tell you that in one part of the country it's burning. Then in the middle part of the country it's a drought. Then in the East Coast it's raining, rain, 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 floods, flooding everything. Here's what I want you to understand. The Bible says in Nahum 1.11, from you, Nineveh, and from you, Assyria, comes forth one who plots evil against the Lord, a wicked counselor. And then in chapter 2 and verse 2 of Nahum, the emptiers have emptied them out and marred their vines and their branches. Now, you know, let me just talk to you for a moment, and I'm not going to get into this too heavy because there's some things I will share with you later on. But when I was preaching in Delaware and I came back to the airport, they call it an FBO, the airport, private airport the next day, there was no electricity. And this was in Maryland. We went from Delaware to Maryland. And we went in, and Robbie will remember this. He travels with us. That the guy said, uh, I said, what's wrong with the airport? The, the, there's no, there's no uh, electricity. He said, you didn't hear what happened last night. I said, no, what happened? He said, a storm hit D.C., and there's almost 5 million people without power. I, I, I didn't laugh, but I said, that's odd. Now, in the winter when it's snowing, it's one thing to lose power. How did they lose power? He said, the weirdest wind that has ever come to this part of the country blew in. I decided to find a little bit about this wind because it says God can send the wind. Nahum's first warning is God can send the wind. So I found out where the wind started, and I found out where it went, and I found out where it ended. So let's just see if anybody can discern a little bit here. The wind started in Chicago, Illinois. The wind traveled 750 miles, tore up everything in its path, and ended up in Washington, D.C. It didn't go beyond D.C. I didn't, it didn't hit up in the Delaware area far to mind. I just kind of went out the coast of D.C., and there were over almost 5 million people, some weeks without power and it was in the center and the in the center of the heat and then I thought about the hurricane that came through recently thank God it was only a level one gratefully it wasn't a two or three but it's odd because Katrina means cleansing and Katrina came through uh, years ago if you remember seven years ago and it didn't it, it hit New Orleans but it was the levees that broke I'm happy to present to you the DVDs and the CDs of the nine services at the recent Hickson main event. Here are the titles of the messages. I preached a message called the Nahum Code and the American Empire. Tommy Bates preached a message, a cave praise. On Wednesday afternoon, I preached on glimpses behind the gates dealing with the mysteries of heaven. On Thursday morning, Jensen Franklin preached teaching angels how to worship. On Thursday night, I preached a message called The First Covenant and the Final Battle. Wait till you hear this one. Friday morning, the dumbest thing I've ever heard in church by Randy Caldwell. What a message that was. Friday night, I preached on The Designed Death to the American Dream. This was probably the most requested message in the history of our ministry as it comes to the fall events. Saturday morning, I, uh, the message was preached, and I preached this message when destiny prevails. And Saturday night, I came back with a very, very important message when believers sin against other believers. Many people are losing their victory in their spiritual life because they're sinning against other believers and may not even realize it. Now, I'm going to tell you how to get these nine messages. You can get the DVD album. The DVDs have portions of the music, the entire message, and also portions of the altar services, along with the pictures that I showed on the screen. The CDs have the message only. Now, here's the ordering information. To get the Hickson CDs for a gift of $60 or more, ask for offer 12HX CD when calling or writing. 
And then if you want to get the DVDs, ask for a 12HX DVD. And for a gift of $95 or more, you can receive uh, the DVDs of the nine messages from the Hickson meeting. Now, let me just tell you how to do that. You can do the one 21 bread number. That's a toll-free number. Or you can order at our website at perrystone.org at any time. Or if you'd like to go ahead and just send in the check of, for the CDs of $60 or more, the DVDs $95 or more, then you can contact us at Perry Stone P.O. Box 3595, Cleveland, Tennessee, 37320. Th these messages are very informative. They're very eye-opening. There's three of those that are major prophetic messages. And the nine messages will be a great album and a great resource tool for you and your entire family. Once again, the main event is now available. On our program, you only see about 22 minutes of a message that normally lasts 60 to 70 minutes in length. And we have to edit certain parts of it out that we don't allow on TV, but will be on the actual CD and DVD, which is unedited. So order your set of DVDs or CDs today. Let me take a moment and share something with you. I had no clue on the opening night of the Hickson meeting on that Tuesday night when I preached on the Nahum Code. Talked about the 150 year cycle that America was in and that Nahum's first warning was God would send a whirlwind. Had no idea that there would be that hurricane coming off the coast, mixing with that cold air, causing the damage that it did in the part of the United States. Now listen to this, where our nation was formed, D.C., Virginia, all the way up into Maryland, all the way up into those territories where the nation was formed. So I'm going to tell you something. If for no other reason that you get the album, get the one on the Nahum Code, it will stun you when you hear it. It stunned me after the storm came through. I'm like, people are reminding me, you preached this. You talked about the cycle we're in. So anyway, uh, just so that you'll know, there's, we, we want to make the Hickson uh, meeting available to you. Uh, it's kind of sad to me because we do six programs and we're only able to show 22 minutes. And uh, people have asked me, why don't we show the whole thing? Because in our ministry, I've discovered that people want to hear the entire message. That's why they love the Israel teaching and the studio teaching. They get an entire message without dividing it up because we don't have a daily program. We only have a weekly program. And sometimes they miss the first program and they get the second one, they miss the third one. So we do it this way because it's more effective for us and for our ministry as well. Now, even though in the month of December, we're taking off to work on the study Bible to help prepare preparations for the new building, working on some mentoring institute, writing some books. We're going to be doing all that in the month of December. In the, after the first of the year, God willing, we're, we're going to be coming to some areas near you. Now, mark your calendar. Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, January 18th, uh, 19th and 20th, Grace World Outreach Church, Pastor Dave Garcia, Brooksville, Florida. Then we're coming to World Outreach Worship Center in Newport News, Virginia. Pastor Russell Evanson is pastor. Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, January 25th to the 27th. We're coming then to the Assembly of West Monroe in West Monroe, Louisiana, February the 8th, 9th, and 10th, and uh, Pastor Shane Warren's church. And then we'll be coming on February the 15th, 16th, and 17th. All these meetings are Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Jacksonville, Florida at New Life Christian Fellowship with Pastor Paul Zink. And then the Sanctuary in Deland, Florida, March 8th, 9th, and 10th. And then, of course, uh, in March 15th to the 17th, we'll be coming to Beaumont, Texas again. So, uh, perrystone.org, if you'll go there, you can get all the information about where we're going to be coming to, and you can set your calendar according to that. And also, uh, the OCI building, thank you for your prayers and support and your continued support for this. We'll be having our partners conference uh, uh, around in, in July. We'll also be, be moving our main event here to Cleveland in the new facility in October. Be telling you more about that later. God bless you.